I think the fear of the unknown, I think people look at the states as, you know, they're familiar with the U.S., but they just think of it's just the taxes and the challenges, the unknown of how to do it. It's just a, too big of a hurdle to consider. And I'm here really to tell you it's not that bad. I mean, the reality is Canadians are the number one foreign investors in the U.S. in general. Welcome to another episode of the Refined Real Estate Podcast. It's Manny here with Ian. We are real estate investors in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Combined, we've bought over 40 units, we've flipped houses, we've wholesaled, and much, much more. Before we get into it, don't forget to like and subscribe on our YouTube channel. Please, if you're listening on Apple or Spotify, please be kind and give us a five-star rating. And also, if you are ever interested in being a, an investor on any of our deals, please don't hesitate to reach out, book a call with Ian, myself, or Janelle. All right, guys, this week we have a, a great guest, a good friend, a mentor, a coach of mine. His name is Thomas Larini. Thomas is an, a, a very accomplished real estate investor, dynamic speaker, innovative leader, He's been investing in Canada and the USA for 15 plus years, and he provides a lot of value to you guys. He's a coach in a, a program that I'm in called Wealth Genius, and I think I think we're all going to learn a lot about investing in the States from Thomas. So Thomas, am I missing anything? No, thank you for the warm welcome, Manny. I appreciate it. No, anytime. So Thomas, where did your investing journey begin? Well, way back, way back. I mean, my story starts in Canada, born and raised in Toronto, and uh, my background is mechanical engineering. And I mean, I was not surrounded around real estate. I didn't grow up in a, in a home or an environment where people were investing in real estate. And it really took me uh, until I wanted to buy my first property just to move out of my parents' home with my first real estate experience. And that was back when I was about 24. I bought that uh, three-bedroom town home and I quickly realized it's more home than I really need for a single guy. So what I ended up doing was I rented the basement. And right after that, I realized this tenant's paying for my mortgage. I like this. I need to do more of this. But, you know, the reality is I put everything I own, I mean, all my savings into acquiring that property. So, um, and I didn't really know how to, you know, scale up from there. And I just kind of did, had that one property for several years. And it really took me joining a group where I quickly learned about investing in real estate. So I kind of fell into becoming a de facto landlord with that one tenant, but really it took me to surround myself on the people who were doing what I wanted to do. So I, you know, I joined a group. I paid to join a group at that time and I realized, wow, these people are doing it. The first conversation I'll never forget was with, a, with someone who, um, the conversation basically, you know, how long we've been investing and how many properties they're owned. And he was like, only five properties. And I was like, wow, only five properties. So my mind kind of like exploded. I'm like, you know, you have five mortgages? He's like, oh yeah. And he, goes, and he felt like, to me, like he felt like, you know, he was he was kind of slow compared to other people. So I was like, I'm in the right place. I'm in the right environment. And um, I joined the group. And within a few months, I bought my next property, which was a duplex. So over the course of the next four or five years, I would just slowly acquire properties one at a time on my own. Again, I was kind of like a slow learning, slow learner. And I just acquired these properties and everything from single family condos, townhomes, semis. Um, and that was kind of like a slow growth of my first five years of investing. And from there, Manny, it really kind of, you know, um, things kind of changed for me and my family where we moved to California. My wife's American. So after five cold winters, we transitioned to warmer climates. And uh, we currently been living in California for the last nine years. So really, it took me, you know, packing up and leaving to really um, start my, you know, to really have the things to kind of escalate and move a lot quicker uh, with, with my investing portfolio and career. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's been a journey. You continue over the to last, invest. I would say, about years. You continue to invest in Canada, right? While you were in California? Yeah, absolutely. So I, my first, when I first moved to California, I didn't know anybody. I had no credit. I had no, no tax, you know, so I had not found my tax return. So, I mean, I was like, I mean, I wasn't able to get any secure, any traditional financing. And because I had about five, six properties back in Canada, I figured why not leverage that and continue to grow my portfolio in Canada until I found, you know, I was comfortable enough and I was in the system here in the U.S. So that's pretty much what I did. I, uh, I started partnering with individuals and things start to scale up from there. Uh, my very first partner was one of my sisters and then from there, friends and acquaintances. And I just JV and I, I went from owning five properties to 20 to 20 to 30. Uh, relatively quick. Um, and then I, you know, after a few years of living in the US, I started to look for markets I could acquire cash flowing properties. And my first investment um, 
in the U.S. was a single family home in Ohio. And at that time, I acquired the property for $80,000. It rented for $1,000 a month. And I was like, this is great. I mean, this was an easy acquisition. So, you know, it was, it was again, a learning curve and just kind of taking one step at a time. Um, and, uh, and from there, continue to, you know, acquire properties on both sides of the border. Um, so it's been an yeah. interesting journey. You know, um, there's some similarities to other people, but also some differences. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. So, uh, but like what we wanted to do with this podcast as well is get into uh, the, the benefits of investing in the state. So we know here, especially in Halifax, I know a good chunk of our listeners are uh, either in and around Halifax, or that's where they're, they're hearing about us. And we have some pretty strict laws that are either few years into effect or some potential ones coming into effect. So uh, we, we understand that things are a little bit harder here as well as the way that lending's done, as well as the, you know, the way they're ca calculating debt service ratio, all this, you know, higher level stuff. So wanted to, uh, to figure out, you know, what are some of the benefits to investing in the state? Yeah, I think there's a tremendous amount of benefits for Canadians. And there's a few things I'll outline. Number one is the states is 10 times the size of a market in Canada. So 10 times the, the population, you've got 50 different markets to invest in. So that alone is just increasing the opportunity for investors. You know, I mean, if you're investing in Canada, you know, I'm sure you use realtor.ca, you kind of go on there. And I know how challenging it is to find some multifamilies. A lot of the bigger deals are usually traded privately between private equity firms uh, through brokerages not even list on the MLS. However, in the US, I'm like, there's just a lot more of everything. You've got a lot more deals, a lot more properties, uh, lenders. Uh, it's a capitalistic environment as well. So access to capital is more plentiful. Um, so you've got the lending world is much more diverse and you can you know, find the different types of terms and programs state by state all across the country. I mean, just to give an example, I'm a realtor here in California. There are programs just specific to California where the state will give you 20% um, of the down payment. So it's a down payment assistance program where the state will give you 20% because they realize how challenging it is for people to save money in a high price market. So right now, there's just an influx of buyers trying to sign up for this free money in essence to allow you to put a down payment. So, you know, people are purchasing a million, million and a half um, homes with this, with, with this specific program in place. Um, so it's really, it's really interesting. Um, but then you have talked about, you know, the markets and landlord being a landlord. There are many markets across the U S which are landlord friendly. And I know how it is investing in Ontario for about 15 years, how challenging it can be when you have a few bad tenants. You know, trying to evict them, non-paying and dealing with some, you know, really challenging tenants can be very tough. The system in Ontario is really heavily favored for tenants. And it's unfortunate for landlords and investors. And now you parlay that into Halifax the US. Too. There are what's that? Halifax is the same. Halifax is the same, right. So I mean, when you compare that to uh, I mean a list of states which are landlord friendly. And when I say landlord friendly, let me explain to you what that means. I mean, you've got markets where there's no rent cap, you can basically increase the rent to whatever you want. There's no rent continuation. So once their leases are over, they're not remaining that property indefinitely. You as a landlord could say your lease is over. Thank you very much. You know, I don't want to renew your lease. You're going to have to leave. Um, eviction times much shorter. I mean, there are some states like Arkansas where not paying your rent is actually a crime and you can go to jail for it, which is remarkable. So it's a whole yeah. complete 180 in terms of mindset of going into, into as an investor where, you know, things are much more in your favor and much more predictable. You know, you acquire a property. Think of this. You acquire a property and you're trying to calculate when turnovers can happen, when I can increase the rent. Well, you're walking into a much more predictable environment. So you can calculate, well, I've got 10 units and I'm looking to you know, increase the rent to X. So I'm going to have to either you know, increase all the rents by a couple hundred or evict and increase two or three units substantially. Well, that, you have the, the power to do that and you can basically approach your tenants. And that's what, that's what I do. It's not always about getting rid of your tenants. I mean, it's, it's explain to them, you know, we're looking to improve the property, 
improve the units. Uh, we need, and then we're looking to re raise rents. You're more than welcome to stay, but the rents will be, you know, at a certain, a certain level in the near future. So they have the option to stay and pay the higher rent or leave. Um, so it's just a lot more. I mean, those are three main benefits I kind of top of mind that come to me as an investor compared to Canada and the U.S. Um, of course, you've got other benefits like the weather and so forth. So, you know, that plays a factor in terms of lifestyle and depending on the type of investment uh you know investments you do you know if you're a short-term rental investor you may want to consider warmer climates people tend to go there for shorter you know vacations that sort of thing so it's something to factor in but i think in general the market size the capitalistic environment access to capital and landlord friendliness are your probably top reasons to really consider the u.s no, absolutely. Couldn't agree more. So obviously we, we agree with you and we're a big fan <laughs> of the U.S. market. But what would you say would be the biggest thing holding Canadians back from going to invest in America? I think the fear of the unknown. I think people look at the states as, you know, they're familiar with the U.S., but they just think of it's just the taxes and the challenges, the unknown of how to do it. It's just a, too big of a hurdle to consider. And I'm here really to tell you, it's not that bad. I mean, the reality is Canadians are the number one foreign investors in the U.S. in general. So more than Mexico, more than China, more than other countries. So you, Canadians are already investing in the U.S. Now it's a matter of like taxation. Well, that's where I tell people, sit down with a cross-border tax CPA attorney, you know, and really understand how to set yourself up to reduce your tax implications, the type of uh, entity to create that makes most sense for you. And, you know, just like anything, you just learn, educate yourself, put you together the right support around you and then execute. So I'm, I definitely want to encourage Canadians to invest, to look into and to invest in the U.S. I'm not opposed to investing in Canada. But I think once you kind of take that step and you do a first deal, you realize, wow, things operate a lot different in the US and a lot more favorable for most in most instances. No, absolutely. Yeah, even from um just like I think the biggest thing though is the opportunity like you said. For for me personally, I don't know about you Ian, like obviously we're both into multifamily and we want to buy these big apartment buildings, but then here in Nova Scotia it's just it's unbelievable, you know. For one, like they don't go on the market. They almost never. I don't know if you've ever seen a 50 plus unit on the MLS here in in Nova Scotia. I don't think I ever have. Um, and, and if I, if and, it, it, and if it's on there, it's rare and it's incredibly overpriced, you know, um, mm -hmm. but there you go down to the States, you go to realtor.com, you go to LoopNet, and they're just everywhere. It's <laughs> the, the inventory is absolutely shocking. And then one other thing here in Canada, we have to work very hard to find information about these buildings. So, you yes. know, how much they owe or how much they bought it for. Like we have to pretty much have direct access to, to brokers or a very forthright seller. But whereas in America, like there's programs out there that have all of this data just right there. All you have to do is scroll through, you know, of course they cost a little bit of money, um, but it's the kind of a pay to play kind of thing because who cares if you have to spend a few thousand dollars, if you find a deal and you can make hundreds of thousands of dollars on the buy, you know? So it's just, um, I don't know. I, <laughs> I can't yeah, speak no, highly that's enough. That's a good point. It's a great point, Manny. I mean, access to information is much more plentiful in the U.S. There's not as much strict uh, you know, privacy laws as in Canada, as you mentioned. And there are tons of different types of um, applications and technology uh, and programs that, you know, as an investor, you can utilize to scrape data, to find out, you know, the information on who owns the building, how long they've owned it, um, if they have a mortgage or not, direct contact information, cell phone numbers, addresses, all these things where you can just approach an owner directly. You can do like you know, mail campaigns. Uh, there are programs that you can literally drive by, drive in for dollars, take a picture of the house, and the app will send a postcard directly to the owner, basically saying, hey, this is your property. I'm, I'm interested to buy it. So, I mean, that's a huge game changer as an investor and looking for opportunities where you're really kind of like behind the eight ball in Canada. You're really restricted. So besides mailing campaigns and door knocking, you don't have too much other, you know, really ways of uh, getting, you know, in touch with homeowners. But in the States, I mean, it's plentiful. Another thing I think we should talk about is affordability. So price points. I mean, you've got price points in the U.S. that are just 
non-existent in Canada. So for the most part, I mean, most of the stuff you're seeing now in Canada, I mean, in most markets, I mean, the price for over a hundred thousand per door, if not like, you know, considerably higher than that, easy hundred K per door. I mean, in the US, you can find $50,000 per door multifamily where rents are exceeding one. Yeah, and easily where rents are exceeding 1% rule. So for those of you who don't understand that, you know, $50,000 per door where the rents are like six, $700 a month on the buy. So on the buy, you know, we're seeing like seven, eight, nine caps. And imagine if you're able to, you know, turn over those buildings at that value. Now you're in double digit territory, you know, and again, those are just not existing in Canada. We were in markets in Canada, you know, where you're like in like three, four, sometimes two, depending on, you know, where you're looking for. So I think affordability is a huge thing where there's many markets across the U.S., which the price point, the barrier to entry is a lot lower, uh, a lot more affordable. And it just makes it a little bit more attractive as an investor where you, okay, I'm going in because remember, I think cash flow is one of the main metrics and, and consideration as an investor you want to think about. Appreciation, you know, that, uh, that, that's kind of like the, the cherry on top. But if you're able to acquire properties, you know, add some value, increase that cash flow. I think that's kind of like the main focus where most investors want to be. And you're seeing that in plenty of markets in the States. Is the competition there? Yes. Our prices have prices gone up, yes, but there has been a slowdown. I think with the interest rates that have gone up considerably in both countries, uh, similar as you've seen in Canada, there has been a slowdown, you know, across the board, but not terribly, not in the sense, not in a similar sense as in Canada. And for another reason, I mean, across the board, the majority of people who have mortgages in the States have locked in their rates for 30 years, which again is something that's not common in Canada. Most people in Canada have locked in their rates, you know, for like four or five years. So their mortgages are coming up for renewal in these high interest, you know, market that we are, we're all you know, involved in versus people in the U.S. I mean, they have the option. They're saying, well, rates are now six, seven percent. I mean, I'm locked in at three. So, you know, what? I won't sell. I'll just remain in this home indefinitely and wait till, you know, things change. I mean, Canadians don't necessarily have that option. So they're much more susceptible to the interest rates, unlike the U.S. So that's another thing for, for Canadians to consider. Yeah. So two, just two things I wanted to touch on real quick. So from um, analyzing deal perspective and doing all that stuff, obviously Janelle's the one that does that the best out of uh, uh, Manny and I, but uh, I've definitely learned a thing or two from her. Um, but two things to, to look at here. So we were underwriting deals in Canada all the time. And uh, Thomas, one of the points that you brought up was some of the lending programs that we have down there. Um, it's just insane. So I know uh, we're going to get into here shortly um, talking about one of the deals that the three of us have uh, in the works right now. But one thing that really set that apart from any of the investments that we're considering up here is the lending options that they give out on it. It's incredible. So uh, I, I am a licensed mortgage broker. I see how things are done here. I know what you know framework is required for down payments, all that stuff. And they just throw so many of those rules out the window and they're just, they're, they're encouraging people to invest down there. Like it's as simple as that. Like, as you mentioned, they're the, in the States, they're encouraging entrepreneurship. They're encouraging growth. They want people to succeed. And here it just feels feels like you're getting beat down left, right, and center, but there, there, there's these, all these different programs for ways that you can succeed down there. And, uh, we will, we will get into that a little bit later, but, uh, that's, that's one point I had to make. And the other point from the analyzing property perspective. So we know cash flow is quite an important metric to look at. Um, and then as we're saying down in the States, like, yeah, we can get these buildings for, you know, 50 grand a unit, 60 grand a unit. That's all fine and great. But the other thing to keep in mind is that the rents are still relatively high. So when you look at uh, another important uh, calculation would be like the gross rent multiplier. So basically determining how many how many period pay pyramids it takes based on the current rents to pay off what your asset is. And you'll find that the, the metrics down there, the, the, the numbers down in the States are still way more favorable, meaning that your, your investment is better. It, it, it's simple as that. So if you look at the pure numbers standpoint, you look at the population, you look at the environment, it's just, it, it's, 
night and day how much easier it is to grow and to succeed down in the states and they they're set up to help you that way so now, let's not, let's not, let's, not, let's, not let's not even talk about the 1031 exchange with another oh, yeah <laughs> <laughs> we were talking about that earlier and i'm just like it's like i try and shield myself from it as a canadian <laughs> currently as a canadian investor because i'm like that is just too good to be true but yeah <laughs> Yeah, no, we have I to mean, tell yeah, them. We have to tell them. Them. what is it? What is it? What's the right. 1031? Yeah, I mean, 1031, you know, I mean, it's amazing, you know, uh, instrument for um, for investors here in the U.S. where you're able to roll in your your gains into the next property within a short period of time. But basically, you're, you're deferring all your capital gains. So in essence, you can just defer taxes indefinitely. So in Canada, majority of the time, you know, once you sell, you're going to pay taxes, right? So what a lot of investors do, they end up holding assets and just refining capital out. So not to the, basically not pay taxes. But at some point, you're going to have some trapped equity in there because the, the service, the income that uh, the property generates won't be able to service any more debt. And then also the lenders are not going to let you access that. They're going to want you to keep in like whatever, 20, 30% minimum. Versus in the States, I mean, investors are encouraged to sell and find a next deal. So that's a, to add to your point, Ian, again, the environment is all there, you know, pro-investor, a lot of tools and mechanisms like this. So in essence, you identify a property within 90 days, you sell um, the proceeds, you don't handle it, it goes to a third party who handles the proceeds and basically you identify a property you're gonna acquire and then you close within 190, 180 days. And if you're able to do that in that short period of time, you basically defer any, any capital gains. So you raise no tax and that becomes the new basis for that new asset. So you do that every four or five years, you can see how you can be trading up into larger and larger assets. So the reality is it's not always about savings more money. It's just there's a strategic game plan you could put in place. And I tell people, I'm like, in 20 years, is it possible to own like a $50 million asset without saving money? Yeah, it is. If you're strategic enough, you know, you start with one property, Hold it for five years, trade up, you know, from 500 to maybe a million dollars and a million to like 3 million and then trade up again, 3 million to maybe 8 million. You know, over the course of 20 years, I mean, it's very feasible to, you know, in the right market climate to achieve that. Um, so, again, something that's not not available in Canada, but is available in the U.S. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, here in Canada, there's rumors of our capital gains tax going up, you know, 75%, <laughs> which is yeah. just incredible. Yeah, yeah. in Canada, I mean, the like system in Canada, tax, 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 tax. <laughs> yeah, and they yeah, can't get yeah, rid I mean, of it. You know? It's like our system depends on it at this point. So if, if they were to try to reel those back, it would just be a huge shock. Whereas America, they, like we said, they're just very, very, very business friendly. They yeah. are truly a capitalistic society. Yeah, absolutely. But I think, um, yeah, I know uh, we're getting a little bit short on time, but we wanted to uh, just do a high level overview. So the three of us uh, have been working behind the scenes for the last few months now, uh, analyzing properties, networking with uh, other investors, property managers, everything down south of the border to uh, actually find uh, a deal for the three of us to buy. And uh, Manny, if you want to start uh, filling us in on something that we have in the works right now, I think our listeners would enjoy that. Yeah. So we, we've came across this deal. So Thomas put me in contact with a real estate agent down there. His name's Tyler. And uh, yeah, Tyler brought me this deal. And on first glance, 24 units, all three bedrooms, they're asking 1.4 or 1.5 mil. So I'm like, all right, Tyler, let's just Let's put an offer in. What's, what does it hurt? You know, well, 1.4 million. And then we'll kind of negotiate them down further was the plan. And they accepted it. <laughs> so again, a large 24 unit, three bedrooms each for 1.4 mil USD. And those kind of numbers just don't exist here in Canada. You know, if this building was just picked up and brought to Halifax, 4 million, 5 million, like it's undoubtedly, you know, um, and one of the reasons is because, like you mentioned earlier, like rent affordability. So like this building, we're buying it, hopefully. Um, <laughs> the, the market rents around eight, 900 bucks. There's a pretty pretty easy lift that we can do on the rents, like comfortably get it to 1100. So here in Halifax, we, if we were to do the same thing, we'd have to allocate X amount of money for cash for keys, you know, five to 10,000 bucks per unit to turn over every single unit. That's expensive. And even then they may say no. And then we have to figure out a way to get them to vacate, whether it be we can try to the rent eviction route here, which we can do in, in Halifax, but it's 
that's a very lengthy process and it doesn't work in our favor most of the time, as I'm sure one, you know, tell us a story about that sometime down the road here, but um, there's a risk that they may just not go, or we'd have to increase that cash for keys offer, which is kind of rampant in Ontario. You hear people having to spend, you know, 20, $25,000 to get people out and getting like, can you imagine $25,000 for 24 units that very quickly adds up? It's a lot of money. Um, but we don't got to worry about that. <laughs> we don't have to worry about that at all. <laughs> so yeah, we have this pretty, pretty juicy deal. Um, and again, touching on other things we mentioned, like incredible finance. Like when we first were doing our numbers on, it, it's like, okay, we needed to raise this amount of money, you know, just to be safe. But then we have a great mortgage broker. She found us someone that is giving us a way better LTV than we could have ever imagined. Rental costs included. You know, um, first year, no mortgage or interest payments that just gets lumped up into the loan. So year one, our cash flow is just our NOI. Like that's significant. <laughs> it just, it, it almost doesn't make sense. But at the same time, we were talking earlier today, it kind of makes sense that USA, when stuff goes south, it goes south fast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here in Canada, we're very, we're very strict. So it's very hard to invest, but it's also more stability. But like in America, it's just the wild, wild west for business. So if you can, if you're a, a stable or a, um, a good operator, you can, you can really utilize the system f to benefit yourself and your investors greatly. Absolutely. Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, so go, go ahead, Ian. Yeah. Just some other um, highlights of the deal. Like, yeah, as he said, so we, we were calculating based on debt service ratio on the buy and yeah, you know, as anyone that's bought any multifamily here, it's, you know, you need that 1.2 debt service coverage ratio. And, you know, we were, we knew we were well below that in the beginning to, if we were going to put, you know, any 80% down or 20% down, get the 80% loan to value. So we just assumed off the hop that, you know, we were looking at, yeah, million dollar raise for renovations, for the down payment, all that stuff. But when they came to us saying, you know, we, we will pay for all the upgrades, we will not, we, we don't necessarily have to get that debt service coverage ratio. It lowered the barrier to entry significantly. And it's giving us basically three years to do a burr on a project. And it, like, it, it's absolutely insane. And like to have, all these three bedrooms, um, yeah, looking at the comparables, it's it's not even outside stretch to consider that the target rents that we're looking for conservatively are going to be attainable. So yeah, definitely excited. Yeah, I guess, yeah, just a few other features. We're about, what, 15 minutes from downtown. Um, Thomas, you've got some buildings in the area. We've already got some boots on the ground from property management to contractors to, um, you know, just people that we need to get a project like this done. Yeah, what's some other highlights I might be missing? Five minute drive from the Cleveland State University, five minutes away from a major hospital. hospital. It's just, yeah, it's, it's a good area. You know, one thing about the States that I feel like we, I just want to touch on briefly is that if you're not from there, you need to, like we said, you need to have strong boots on the ground because from street to street, it can be extremely different. The quality of the building, the quality of the tenant that you'll find. So be, be careful because sometimes even though the price per door is cheap, there may be a very, very good reason why. You know, just a quick example. I looked at a deal one time, South Carolina, 72 units. I forget the exact price, but it was like 20K door, Ian. I think we were looking at it together. Yeah. But then you do a little research on the area and it's like their median income was incredibly low. I think it was like 15,000 USD. I, yeah, you know? I remember this one. <laughs> yeah, and in very high crime rate. Um, like I, I read online about the apartment building, you know, there was a lot of prostitution going on within that apartment building. So cool, we could have got this building real cheap, but then then what, you know, stabilizing this thing would have been a nightmare. Um, it wouldn't have gone well at all. So like this area, luckily in Cleveland, we were able to talk to multiple realtors, my inspector, you know, Thomas has people there as well. So we know the area is, it's pretty good. Like three, four streets up, now it's like, okay, a little rougher, but it's just, it's crazy how much, you know, a few streets can make a large difference, but this area, it's in a pretty good, like we would, I, if I were to give it a letter grade, you know, C plus to B, B minus, you know, it's not peak Cleveland real estate, but at the same time, that's why the price is what it is. Um, and this is the perfect kind of asset class to kind of get into if you want to execute a value add 
value add to it and burrowed all the investor money. Yeah, I Absolutely. agree. I mean, you cannot build this building for the price that we're acquiring it at. These are three bedroom units, all three bedrooms. It's remarkable. So, and then I'm also like to kind of you know, revisit you mentioning the boots in the ground. That's huge. You need to have a solid team in place for wherever you're planning to invest. I mean, you need people who know that market, need to know, understand you know, the tenant profile, how to manage them, how to get the rents where you need to get. And even going into this thing, as we analyze the deal, we want these individuals to kind of cross-qualify and confirm, you know, what we're looking at and what we're what we're anticipating, you know, numbers to be if we're making sense, comps, uh, sale comps and rent comps, all this data that we, we, we want to make sure. I mean, again, you can do everything from online. You can get quite a bit of information just doing virtual, but you really want to have local people just giving you that clear confirmation that, you know, I mean, what you're looking at is legit and, and in place to, you know, be successful. Yeah, absolutely. We, um, yeah, we really believe in this deal and we think it will be a good test case for future deals moving forward. And, um, when this podcast releases, we will hopefully be firm <laughs> and we can, yeah, we'll <laughs> definitely tell you guys how it goes along the way and we'll be able to educate others. Yeah, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us. This has been, it's been great to have you here. And I'm sure our listeners will really, really enjoy hearing about your story and investing in the United States. Well, thank you for having me, gentlemen. It's a pleasure being here. I'm excited to see what you guys are doing. And uh, yeah, onwards and upwards, my friends. All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Refined Real Estate Podcast. If you liked it, please, please share with your friends, your family, anybody, and give us a five-star rating on Apple or Spotify, or give us a thumbs up, a like, and a comment on YouTube, and continue to share our message. And if you have any questions, please reach out to Ian and I or Janelle, book a call, hit us up on Instagram, and we love talking real estate, so we're happy to discuss anything with you guys. USA investing, Canada investing, all of it. Yeah.